Our next presentation is by Deborah Sarland, Eli Jacobson, Leonard Milner, and Felice Gillespie. Uh, and they will be talking about their experiences with blended learning in uh, classes. We've called our presentation a classic blend. We're focusing on um, the classics and, and blended learning. And um, Len Mulner is our faculty member who is a full professor in classics and also does um, work through Harvard um, you, on uh, their innovative programs um, using classics texts. We also um, will hear from Belisi Gillespie, who is the teaching assistant from this course, Eli Jakobsen, who is the media tech systems administ administrator, Jacobson, <laughs> Deb Sarlin, um, I'm Deb Sarlin, and I'm the teaching um, and learning designer, and um, Okay. You can take it away. Okay, great. So, um, this is about teaching ancient Greek, which is difficult. Um, it's it's uh, difficult for um, a lot of reasons. <clears throat> the main reason is that yeah, it's a language that you, you have to understand the language. A language that you have to learn without being able to speak it. Um, and um, but as everyone knows, that's the way we all learn our languages is by speaking them. Um, what we try to do is to make um, a, an advantage of this uh, problem. Um, and what we're trying to do is to teach people to translate texts in ancient Greek. Actually, there are people who do try to speak ancient Greek, but it's a completely artificial exercise because we know that all the texts that we have are not spoken language. It's very easy to tell. So um, what we do is we try to teach people the morphology, the syntax, um, and also the history of the language and, and to, understand, to make them understand the systematic qualities. Um, and it's a process of teach, making conscious all the things that are unconscious for a person who actually speaks a language. Um, uh, the, the, the best example of the problems that the, this creates is the story about um, uh, Antoine Meillet, who was maybe one of the greatest historical linguists that ever lived who knew every Indo-European language there was, or wrote the, the historical grammars of them, but he could only speak French. <laughs> <laughs> so the problem is to, to, to learn and understand enough about the language and then to practice it enough so that you can actually read and use it as a, a read it like a person who actually knows it from speaking. Um, so I've been doing this for 45 years, and I just finished I've retired from Brandeis this semester, so but I think this time, my here's my big message is that uh, finally in my last semester, I think I figured out how to do this. And the main thing is that the, after experimenting with learning, with, with teaching Greek and getting people to learn it for 45 years, what happened to my class is that it devolved into a, a situation where I spent most of the time with students. I would, they would have a homework assignment, and they would try to do it. And they would come into class and say, I can't understand this sentence, OK? So that the classroom time became an opportunity for us as a group to go over individual sentences and to figure out what they didn't understand. The, the standard way of teaching that I've learned myself and that helped carried on in most universities is it's a lecture and recitation process. So the professor lectures on what the grammar is, and then the students have homework, okay, that, that they do, but, the, but also the students are called upon to translate sentences in class, and then they get embarrassed or flustered. Mm -hmm. It's not a good process, okay? Lecturing, I think it's well known. The disadvantages of lecturing for us, for, for grammar, I think it's a difficult thing, especially so, because you're trying to make people understand a whole bunch of details and the complexities of the system. If you're listening to a lecture on a, gram on a grammatical item, and for one moment your mind wanders because of something fun mm -hmm. happening outside, or you think of something mm -hmm. that you're going to do later on, you can be lost for the rest of the lecture. Right? And, and so it's a very ineffective and hit or miss thing. So, um, what, what, what I wanted to, what I've always wanted to do is to maximize the time that I spent with students translating sentences. It's repetition that we all need um, to, to learn a language. That's the great advantage of speaking, is that you keep on using it over and over again. So, 
So um, I wanted to maximize the time that I could spend with the students uh, translating sentences. That's, that's what we were trying to teach them. So um, what happened was, with the help of, of Eli and Deb and Belicia as well, we came up with a solution to put the grammatical lectures online. Um, and I'm going to show them to you. In a very simple way, that's what they look like. We had on one hand a vocabulary a blackboard program, which Felici had a much better handwriting than I do, and mm -hmm. did set up with, with colorful um, uses of tense. And on the other hand, there were the two of us talking about how the grammatical concept worked. So the idea, I mean, we decided that it was good to have talking heads and an interactive thing because it's more. After all, learning Greek is the basic humanistic discipline. We wanted it to be people interacting with the students and with each other. Um, so we set up these little videos. There, the longest one I think is 13 minutes. That was really pushing. We didn't want to do that. They're, the most of them are between three and five minutes long. Some are, there, are seven and eight minutes long on discrete uh, concepts of the Greek grammar. And, uh, and with the software that we have there, they're all online and available to the students in the sequence of the course. And that freed up the class time okay, for us to talk about, to actually engage in the activity of reading sentences. Most of the time, the two of us, Felicia and I, who is a whiz at Greek grammar, okay, a wonderful teacher as well, um, uh, um, was we split the class into two parts in order to maximize the time that, we, that each student had translating sentences. If, you, if, we, if, we, if we divided it in half, they had twice as many chances to translate sentences. And, and, uh, and so we, and they were all sentences, we would have them translate sentences that they hadn't done before. Okay. So they also had homework to do, and, and they got feedback on their homework. And my experience is that the feedback on the homework is the least effective way of getting, getting, people, getting people to learn a language, getting them to do it in front of you seeing what they, the mistakes that they were making, correcting them and clarifying what their, what their concepts were that they were confused about, that was the best way. So um, we, we, uh, we, we uh, set things up to have to work this way, and um, we actually taught Greek twice in this, in this fashion. fashion. Um, we, Greek starts at Brandeis in the spring semester, while most languages start in the fall. Um, the idea there was that we weren't competing with modern languages, and we wanted to get as many people as possible to learn ancient Greek. So we we we, uh, we started last fall, which is with a class that had learned in a more conventional way, and um, we used this this software. And we we uh, what happened was about halfway through, we had a revolt on the part of the students. Okay. They said they wanted to learn it the old way, okay? Which the old way was just the semester before, mm -hmm. okay? In other words, w w there were there were some of them who were not so insistent, but we had a group that that said they didn't want to watch videos; they wanted me to explain these things to them. And, and so this resistance, I mean, I think it was simply a matter. Of it, and, and in fact, we were I was really encouraged by it because it seemed to me that they were learning things much more successfully, okay? So it didn't have anything to do with how efficient the learning process. It was a matter of what they were used to and resistance to change. Um, the second time, which was this spring, we started out with a brand new group of students. We didn't tell them about any other way of teaching Greek. <laughs> I knew of no other way. And it was a smashing success. <laughs> we, we, they, they learned the language much better than I've ever seen in all my 45 years of, of, of teaching Greek. So that's basically what I have to tell you. Um, other people are going to now talk about other parts of the process. Hello, everyone. Hello, my name is Felici. So, Ezra, I pretty much told you, um, you know, how it can be beneficial, uh, how it's different, and um, and that students can be reluctant to deviate from their their own study habits. So, I'm just going to wrap up his overall sentiments pretty quickly with a few notes on results, observations. Um, maybe a little insight from the student perspective. Um, one general note about our approach is that we didn't really attend the videos to replace any information in the textbook or anything. Um, we just hoped that the videos would relegate the more passive part of learning uh, to the student's own time. So the videos are formatted as a supplement to the textbook. 
Um, in these, we also pointed them to places where they could go for their information, um, see, see things written out so that they could use their time effectively between the video and the, and the course material. Um, so what was the advantage of this? As you may have gathered by this point in the day, um, the advantage of flipping the classroom was that they had to think on their feet in class, right? They had to answer questions without flipping through their notes, without looking back into the book. Um, they, you know, they had to actively engage with the material and think off the top of their head with our help, of course, in class. Um, and one thing that we didn't actively do during the semester was really monitor who was logging in when, how long they were sitting in front of the computer watching the videos. Um, we, we didn't really monitor the online access while we were doing it. I'll come back to this point. But first, mostly because with this method, you can really kind of gauge how the students are doing just by, just by watching them, right? Just by being in class. If they hadn't done the videos, they hadn't watched the videos, or if they hadn't looked at the material, you know, they, they couldn't answer a question. And every single classroom, every single student is called upon to answer a question, translate, participate in some capacity or another. Um, don't worry, we didn't make them suffer too much if they hadn't <laughs> watched the video. Um, but once we got together with Deb afterwards to, to reflect on the overall experience, we did take a look at those numbers. Um, so you can see on the slide behind me that with 14 students in the class, most of the videos got 12 to 14 total views every single time, and an average of three to four views per day. So these numbers are consistent throughout the whole semester, um, and they, they show real persistence and dedication on the part of the students, right? They had to do this every single day. Um, so needless to say, we were pretty happy with the results, I think. Um, and so just some observations from the students who were taking the class. Many of them came up to us and, and said that they really liked being able to manipul manipulate the flow of learning, right? They could pause, take notes, replay, fast forward, rewind, skip ahead. If they didn't want to, they could really um, just tailor um, the videos, like watch what they really needed to, what they were struggling with, and then what kind of skip around if they needed to um, for things that they already felt very comfortable with. Um, another note, participating in a language class is never easy. In ancient Greek, you know, you sound really funny when you're trying to read a different alphabet and pronounce a word at the same time. So it's easy to become self-conscious. Uh, but this method, method really put them all on the same playing field, I guess. Um, they didn't feel any competition, they told me anyways, and said it made them feel as if they had kind of gone through the trenches together and, and really stuck it through because they had to do the hard and the awkward parts together. Um, basically, the system is somewhat harder just because you have to be a little bit braver in class and you have to speak out and, and be responsible for the material every single day. Um, so ultimately, I think it's a little bit more rewarding too because they have to they have to suffer through the FaceTime and the actual work that any language takes behind the scenes. Um, so now that we have seen these statistics and heard the feedback from the students, we can think about you know improvements for the future. Some of these might be um, finding easy ways for students to annotate the video, similar to what you're doing in your um, classroom, and finding a way that that can happen on a collaborative basis, but also maybe a, a personal private basis. So, you know, something that again, is tailored to every student's needs and um, abilities. And, um, you know, basically using these tools to help them help each other <laughs> while also engaging with the technology as we move forward. So we've learned a lot, I think, this past year, and there's only room for growth, I think. Um, and finally, just a little blurb about my own experience. I'm a student, too. Not everybody else that I've heard from today is a teacher. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> just so that you know, it's, it's a nice multi-layered uh, learning learning experience. Um, and I was able to watch the transition from a lecture-based classroom to a flipped classroom. I was involved in all the steps along the way, both technical and educational. So, and I was able to learn from somebody who, who continually tries to maximize and learn about learning um, and make the learning experience impactful for, for his students. So I learned on all, kind, all kinds of levels. <laughs> um, and I myself had to continuously engage and test myself on this material, uh, both when we're recording the videos and we're helping with the students in class and everything. So, you know, I get to I get to practice the material plus the teaching part, do a little little grading, a little guidance, but a little um, a little fun too. And so in the end, 
You know, there may be no perfect system for teaching an ancient language, but exploring new avenues and utilizing these new technologies can only help in the effort um, in my preparation for a career, a career in teaching. You know, it's important for me to stay abreast of all these new options, but also understand why the old options were in place too. And just overall, it's been multi-layered, multi-generational, multilingual, and multimedia. <laughs> I'm Eli. I uh, support uh, digital media systems at, at Brandeis, which uh, I guess includes the realm of lecture capture, which is, I guess, what um, we get, I guess what this sort of falls into. Um, and so I'm just going to talk briefly a little bit about the technology that we're using and how we decided to <laughs> to, to come up to, to use these specific solutions. Um, uh, the, uh, the biggest thing with getting, uh, you know, new users to adopt technology is ease of use, um, and that's like the number one thing that we think about when we're evaluating new technologies and new products. Is how we get, you know, people that aren't necessarily, uh, I guess, naturally comfortable with new technologies and the idea of, you know, recording your own things isn't isn't for everybody. Or at least they don't think so until they try it. And so mm -hmm. that's why we were excited when we when we came across this uh, a really easy to use solution um, that actually integrated with part of our existing infrastructure. Um, so I just want to talk about these two systems that we have. Not that necessarily they're the right tool for everybody, but why I think we I just here's how we got to where we did. Um, Ensemble Video is a uh, video hosting system. Um, it's basically where we store all of our digital content for uh, anything related to, to, to courses. So it's sort of like on YouTube. So that's where anything media can, can end up. And we have, we've had that for quite a while. Collage is sort of a new thing for us because we learned about it and found out that it integrated with that. And that was the ease of use part that we were especially excited about um, because basically anybody can uh, install this software and with a single click record their presentation and then get it up there. And that, that step of making it easy to uh, to get it up on the web and to distribute to students is especially important. So um, right, these, these two systems sort of talk to each other. And that's how sort of this solution came together. And uh, so yeah, one button, one button recording and one button publishing is how we came to, to use collage, and then Ensemble also integrates with our LMS. So sort of all these all these different systems sort of work together, and we're always looking for reducing the number of steps that uh, faculty are or staff uh, need to go through in order to be comfortable with the technology and just make sure that it that it works. Um, also, uh, you know, we're always looking for opportunities for adoption. So. One thing is just making it easy to use, and the other part is, uh, you know, I guess l looking for opportunities for, you know, he, we had a great opportunity here with with Lenny and Belize, uh, you know, who were using, found a way to use technology in a way that um, <laughs> uh, to add to the class. It was like like they said, they weren't teaching anything that wasn't already in. The, you know, that wasn't that they wouldn't have done in class. These were all extra, um, extra value added. I guess. I guess is a good way to put it. So anyway, I'm, I, that, that's really it uh, for technology. Um, but I just wanted to let you guys know that uh, I don't know. That's it for now. We're good. <laughs> Thanks. And just to say a little bit about my colleagues, um, Belisi, from this experience of teaching with Lynn, is now going on and perhaps might have her own teaching career. She's going to be a doctoral candidate at Berkeley. And Eli, um, while he very enthusiastically supported this tool, has also done an amazing job to work with the vendor to provide a lot of feedback and to talk a lot about how these tools work together. And has been really wonderful in um, explaining to faculty why a tool like Collage that lets you either use audio to talk over something, if um, that's a format that you prefer, 
or allows you to have a screen and a representation of yourself as a smaller video within that and allows you to do captures of just what's on your computer and allows you it, it that kind of option Eli understood as somebody who's a technician that faculty might have very different needs and so found a tool that integrated well both with our as he said um, Brandeis YouTube and with our learning management system Moodle and that kind of sensitivity from somebody in a TA role and from somebody in a technology role has really made blended learning at Brandeis um, more palatable and more possible. And that's, it's, that's really exciting. Um, part of what I do with faculty um, is work to design instruction. And um, you know, we've heard a lot about experimentation and you know, loosely um, moving into a classroom when you're not so sure of technology and exploring with students. But the truth of the matter when you, is, is sort of unpopular. And so I'm going to be incredibly unpopular and say that blended learning is really best when an expert who's been teaching in that content area for quite some time decides to reimagine and re-envision what they're going to do in their classroom. If somebody is not fantastic at cartography, if someone is not already a great teacher of philosophy, a great teacher of Greek, possibly that is not going to be successful. So for any new faculty who might be watching this and thinking about um, blending or flipping their classroom, teach the content first. Because that experience will really help you think about what are those elements that need to live in the online space? And what can I actually do in my classroom if I take those elements that I hate doing time and time again and move those into the virtual space? Lenny is somebody who likes collaboration, who likes conversation. So it made a lot of sense for him, considering his experience as the sage and the scholar, to work with the younger um, Greek uh, representation of Artemis. So in my sense, you know, Zeus and Artemis were working together on this fantastic conversational way of teaching. And the reason Lenny was excited about this was because he wanted to bring the stories from Greek into his classroom to have the students really touch and work with. They were talking about sentences, but those sentences were part of deep stories and part of the Greek mythological space that these two um, were, were setting up. And that was an incredibly um, wonderful um, design. Design is based on experience, but it's also iterative. Things change, just like our colleagues said, you know, things will change as we figure out what students like and don't like, and you have to head into an experience like this with the understanding that it's not this moment only, it's an iterative situation that can change. Um, that you repeat, and part of learning is repeating. But what is it that you as a faculty member repeat every time you teach that class that you don't want to repeat again? That can be that element that becomes the online portion of your class. For Lennon Belisi, it was a conversation, and that worked. For other people, it might be that voice over a process that they then put online. It really depends on a faculty member's experience um, and reflection on their own content. So the content in itself, as well as a faculty member's experience, is going to drive the what does that flipped video look like. It might be very different, and that flavor is going to be important for success. Because unless it is something very personal, the students won't buy it. And I don't mean won't buy it in um, in a combative or a transactional way, but really won't accept that learning experience as part of the challenge of a full semester course in the liberal arts tradition. Design um, is also based on an understanding of our learners. And um, so I wanted to share something that doesn't get repeated quite enough. Charles Zubin, who has been working on fully online learning for a very, very long time, is um, a real scholar in the area. And he doesn't present on his own uh, research any longer. And I wanted to bring it to your attention because it's interesting to think about. 
um, we know that students um, move up, uh, along a continuum of active and passive. Right? You can imagine that. Right now, you are all sort of passive, but I feel like you're with me, so it is an active group. Um, you're looking back at me. I feel that you're here. But that's not really what Charles meant by active and passive. He meant um, more on the Myers-Briggs scale of, are you an actively engaged learner? Do you take a lot of responsibility? Or are you generally someone who's more on the, I need to get more from you in order to really learn well? Are you someone who takes that flag and you know goes along your own way? Or are you somebody who really needs that interaction? You fall along your, um, this continuum yourself as a learner, so do your students. Match that with the dependent-independent possibility. So if we match dependent and active, what does that student look like? What does it mean if you're really dependent on your faculty member and you're also a very active person? <clears throat> What does that look like? You've seen that probably in your own class. You're nodding your head. Mm -hmm. If somebody is very dependent and very active, they send you email all the time, email today, to say, how am I doing? Did you get my paper? And in the classroom, you sense that that person is really, you know, I need this information because I need to succeed. That's a little different from the independent scholar who's also very active, who might be somebody more like Belisi, who's going on for her own career, her own doctorate, um, and knows her own path, but is also really actively engaged with the whole process. That's the delightful student that we, we all hope to have many of in our classroom. Um, if we think about the passive dependent, that's a student who's a good learner. That's somebody who really needs your interaction um, and, and can still be cajoled. An independent passive person is going to be that person who's you know, maybe not showing up. And so that person probably isn't going to succeed in the strong liberal arts tradition, and we worry about them. Why is this important for the blended learning classroom? This is important because if you can think about those four students, those four ways of being in the classroom and can design something for each of those four characteristics, you've got your class. If you as a faculty member can say, what is that piece that I need to design that's the online element? What am I really excited about doing in the classroom when I'm with my students? I want to go back to storytelling. I want my students to really engage and grapple with the language of stories. In, in one case. And then if you can say, I mean, I know that I need to develop something that works for that dependent active, that dependent passive, that independent active, and that independent passive. If you can create those either learning modules or readings or ways for students to create exhibits together or alternate ways of developing papers or you know find something that works in each of those boxes you have a really interesting blended learning class and um, if you have any additional questions about either instructional design or greek and getting started in um, blended learning or in specifically collage or ensemble we're all interested in um, sharing knowledge with the rest of the liberal arts community and on that, I imagine there might be some questions, yeah. hopefully.